Uh, my name is Jackie Fletcher and I'm from the Jabs Group, a support group for parents of vaccine damaged children. And I set the group up with my husband and two other families back in 93 because each of us, um, <coughs> three children, believed to have been suffered severe damage following the MMR vaccine. In my boy's case, he's 20, but he's still like a 14 month old. He suffered a catastrophic reaction 10 days after the vaccine, which left him with a, a seizure disorder, um, unable to walk, talk, um, he needs full round the clock care and will do all his life. So because of him, we set up the jazz group. I've invited him tonight to, to talk with you, and what I'd like to talk to you about is firstly the jazz group itself, how jabs came into being, the aims and objectives, the MMR vaccine itself, because although we cover every vaccine and most of the problems relate to every vaccine, it's the MMR that's been in the headlines the most in the last 20 years. I'd also like to tell you where we're up to currently because it's still in the news. And I'd like to ask if you have got any questions or any points that you want to raise with me, if you could please wait till the, the end of my talk and then I'll be happy to try and answer anything or, or talk through any points that you're interested in. So our group, it was formed in 93 because Every time we were being admitted to hospital with our son, we were meeting other families who believed that their children had also suffered a major reaction. Initially, we thought it might be just one contaminated batch that the children shared because we were all from the same area. But as we started to investigate it, we found that the, the product sheet for the vaccine was actually specifying the types of problems, the symptoms and long-term problems that the children were actually suffering with. In my boy, epilepsy, neurological damage, there was chronic arthritis, diabetes, um, blood platelet problems. Problems that we had not been warned about before they actually happened. So because of that, we, we got some of the families together and we held um, an inaugural meeting at the town hall in Wigan. And following that, we got lots of media coverage. Um, parents started to come forward and each time we took their accounts to the press, more families came forward. And in 1994, the Department of Health determined that there was going to be a measles epidemic and decided to revaccinate 8 million school children aged between 5 and 16. They said the epidemic was going to be so severe that they had to do something. And the Department of Health said that because most of these school children would have had either a measles jab before or may have had measles itself, the risk of a long-term problem would be very remote and they classified it with the usual phrase of one in a million. Well, 12 months after that campaign, when they did a review, the Health Minister, Tom Sackville, and you can track him down on Hansard website if you want to see it for yourself, reported that from the 8 million children, there hadn't been eight severe reactions, there'd been 530 severe reactions. Thousands of minor reactions, but 530 severe ones. And many of those families had actually contacted our group, the Jabs group, and had reported very severe problems like epilepsy, bowel disease, post bowel fatigue syndrome, uh, vision problems, and they'd been dismissed by their own family doctor. Now Tom Sackville, when reported in Hansard, he spoke in the House of Commons about the 530 reactions and he played the numbers game. He immediately said that three quarters of those children had fully recovered. Now the families who'd been in touch with us were absolutely adamant that the child still had epilepsy, still couldn't go to school, still was having major problems, but he'd instantly dismissed three quarters of them. The other quarter, with remaining long-term problems, Tom Sackville said, well, there's always a background prevalence of these conditions, and so we cannot prove that it wasn't just a coincidence. So from vaccinating 8 million children, according to the Department of Health, no child has suffered any long-term problem whatsoever. And that's how the politics can actually override it straight away. We still got media coverage about this and we were constantly taking this back to the press. But because we weren't getting anywhere with the Department of Health, 
we decided to try and pursue it legally. And we approached solicitors, and after much to and fro we managed to get the elusive legal aid certificates for many of the families, so we could actually pursue a multi-party legal action. And that's what many of the families started to do. Meanwhile, because we were getting so many reactions coming through to us, and we were sending out questionnaires to the families to try and find out what was going on with the families, and we didn't do any prompting, we just said, please describe what's happened to your child. And the family started to send the questionnaires back. And what we noticed very quickly was the parents' accounts were very similar. They were reporting the same time frames known to the manufacturer, the incubation periods. They were reporting the same symptoms. And they were reporting the same long-term problems that were classed as the rare event in the product sheet. What we'd also asked the parents was, had this child's reaction been put forward to the government watchdog? Because if anyone has a problem with any drug product, they're supposed to use a yellow card to put it forward to the government watchdog, the Medicines Health Regulatory Authority, to supposedly have it investigated. And the vast majority of these questionnaires were coming back, no, that's not been done. So because of that, we were determined to try and take it to the Health Minister. And again, after many months, we managed to secure a meeting with the Public Health Minister, Tessa Jowell. And I went along there to represent the JABS group. We had our legal team with us, but we also had a team from the Royal Free. You may have heard of Dr. Wakefield and Professor Walker-Smith. So we went along to this meeting, and we also had the heads of the Department of Health, the Chief Medical Officer, Principal Medical Office, all the big wigs were around that table and we secured an hour with them. Now up to us entering that room, the Health Minister and the colleagues could have said we weren't aware of the problem that we were about because the yellow card system wasn't working. But we actually took an anonymised list of all the children and presented it to them. And on there we were stating the child's name, date of birth, sex, when they were vaccinated, how they were before, what happened, and the long-term problems. And these children come from all walks of life, including the medical profession. We've got doctors, nurses, health visitors, consultants, reporting that their children have also suffered long-term problems. When we've on the quiet asked them would they go public on it, they've said, sorry, it's more than a job's worth, even though it was the child. Norm that the pension will go, uh, Norm I'll get in trouble, so they hadn't done that. But the families were from all walks of life. And these reactions, they've not been properly investigated by the medical profession in relation to vaccines. Uh, they were just being all classed as coincidences. So at that meeting, I asked Tessa Jowell if she could instigate a scientific investigation of these children and to try and find out how much was coincidence and how much was, hang on, there's a major problem with this vaccine. What she told me was that she was prepared to look at all scientific evidence when it became available. And I said, but we're parents, we can't do a scientific study of our own children. And she immediately said again, I'm prepared to look at all scientific evidence as it becomes available. What she did agree to was that when Dr. Wakefield's work was published, and it was due to be published six months later, she would organise an independent forum where Dr. Wakefield could call experts from home and abroad to actually get round on a platform and the Chief Medical Officer could contribute as well. So we could thrash out with experts who knew the subject what was actually going on. That's what she promised. And at that meeting, Dr. Wakefield alerted them to the fact that his infamous Lancet report was due to be published six months later. And he wanted to make sure that Tessa Jowell was aware that it might cause a little bit of fuss, which it caused a lot more than that. But he also knew that at that time, the single vaccines were still available on the NHS. And he wanted to make sure they got stocks of them in case when his report came out, 
parents started to reject the combined vaccine. He wanted to make sure children would be covered one way or another. I went further than that at that meeting. I said, because we were presenting you with so many adverse reactions, the MMR should be suspended immediately. Knowing that the single vaccines could be there if any parent wanted to go down that route, but we shouldn't carry on with something when we've got all these reactions that you didn't know about on the table. So we waited to see what would happen after the Lancet paper was published. I must admit, when I came out of that meeting and got home, I was absolutely furious that I'd heard a news report that the Chief Medical Officer had come out of that meeting and told the BBC that he'd had a meeting with a group of concerned parents and was reassured that there would only be minor side effects. He said, um, the NMR still remains the best way to protect your children. And um, thinking about it, would we really have got an hour's time with these bodies to talk about something minor? We wouldn't have even gone ourselves. Mm. But that's the way that went. Anyway, after the Lancet report was published, there was a press conference and all hell broke loose. The media jumped on what Dr. Wakefield has said and it was splashed all across the headlines about MMR potentially linked with, with autism. The Department of Health came out with big guns. They reversed the attack and immediately suspended the single vaccines, the single dose vaccines that were no longer available on the NHS. They also went a step further. The medicines health body contacted the licensed importers that were bringing single vaccines in for the private clinics and revoked their license just for measles, mumps and rubella jabs. Nothing else, just those. So any parent that was concerned about the MMR couldn't go to the NHS and couldn't go to the private clinics. So it was MMR or nothing. The private license importers did protest legally and publicly and eventually got the licenses reinstated. So now, as it stands right at this minute, parents can go down that, but it's costly and involves journeys that parents shouldn't have to take, and it's not really what parents want to do. What they also did with the Department of Health was launch a full-scale attack on the authors of the Lancet study. There were a team of 13 contributors to that Lancet study, and the Department of Health put pressure on them to retract the whole paper. Now this paper had been peer reviewed by the Lancet and published many years before and it had been accepted as fine. But suddenly there was a question over the accuracy of it. And the accuracy was because the three letters MMR had actually been mentioned within the report. When the, within the report, in case you don't know about it, there were, it involved 12 children that had got severe bowel problems and eight of the parents blamed the MMR vaccine or some of the doctors blamed the MMR vaccine. And that's how all that was actually mentioned in the report in regards to it. But because Dr. Wakefield knew there were um, a, a torrent of other families waiting to be investigated, that's why he'd raised a flag and said it needs to be investigated. But the Department of Health came down hard on the authors of that paper. And 10 of them eventually signed a retraction of the interpretation of the paper. Not the paper itself, just the bit to do with MMR. The other three, well, three of their doctors as well, were hauled before the GMC. So they were brought before the General Medical Council with a shopping list of charges. I couldn't believe it when I saw it, but it seemed to be absolutely everything going was being blamed on these three doctors. It was the longest hearing. It lasted three and a half years, two and a half years. It was the longest hearing in the GMC's history. It cost them a fortune, and eventually, one of the doctors was reprimanded, Professor Simon Merch. But Dr. Wakefield and his boss, the world renowned gastroenterologist who submitted many papers all around the world, he and Dr. Wakefield were both struck off charged with um, malpractice. Now, the, while this was actually going on, 
the doctors determined that they might have to appeal the case, but it cost a lot of money to appeal. At the end of it, when they were struck off, Dr Wakefield could not afford to take it to the High Court, but his boss did, Professor Walker-Smith. And Professor Walker-Smith, when he went before the High Court this year, the High Court judge determined that he was totally exonerated, that the GMC had been wholly out of order in the way they'd operated. He instructed them to change the way the GMC operated and they've adopted all the changes. And they've reinstated the license for Professor Walker-Smith. But as I said, Dr Wakefield wasn't in a position financially to pursue justice through the High Courts, so he remains struck, struck off. He's not stopped work at all, he's over in the States at the moment and he's actually bringing a libel suit against the journalist that issued the original complaint to the GMC. With the GMC hearing, no parent had actually complained, no child had been injured. The parents were outside supporting the doctors, saying that the children that had been under the care of the three doctors and the, the other, well, were 13 in total, had had the best possible care and some of the children's lives had improved because of that care. But the result was that uh, Professor Walker-Smith has now got his license back, he's been wholly exonerated, but Dr Wakefield is still trying to pursue justice in America against uh, a libel action for the journalist Brian Deere and the BMJ because they published Brian Deere's work. In the meantime, the multi-party action was going on, and had been going on. We'd had legal aid for our boy for 10 years. And in 2003, just six months before the cases were due to get to court properly, legal aid was withdrawn. Now, no parent can take on the biggest drug companies in the world if you've not got legal aid. And we, so we'd had legal aid for 10 years for all. And then just before we're due to get to court, it's gone. Um, we took it before Mr Justice Keith. Some of the families, myself included, pressed on for another two years trying to get legal aid back and try and keep it in the courts. Because there's a, you can, there's a time deadline. You've got to do it within 10 years under the Consumer Protection But we came to a, a juddering halt with that in 2007. So that left us as a family with very little place to go because we tried through the courts, we tried with the Department of Health. So we went back to what's known as the government's vaccine damage payment unit. You may not be aware of this, but the Department of Works and Pensions has actually got a vaccine damage payment unit. And if your child suffers uh, an injury that is 60% or more, you can apply to have it assessed. Now, there's a criteria in that if your child happens to die from that injury before they reach the age of two, they can't assess it. They're not obliged to assess it. There is actually a point of law in the Act saying you can only apply after your child turns two. Well, when are most baby vaccines given? Before they turn two. And so there is that horrendous cut-off that nobody's aware of. Even if you're aware of the Vaccine Damage Payment Unit, you're not aware of the strict criteria. Not every vaccine applies either. So if your child happens to have had something that's not on the list, you can't apply for it either. We applied for our son back in 93-94, and it was immediately turned down. So we reapplied in 96, when we got some new evidence that was turned down. So when the court case came to a juddering halt, we actually went back to the Vaccine Damage Payment Unit, but because we'd been going through all the legal process, we'd actually got two medical reports, one from a paediatrician and one from a neurologist, and they both supported that Robert suffered brain damage due to the MMR. Also, the firm of solicitors that had been helping us right till the very end when legal aid stopped, they helped us to get legal aid back. They set a precedent. Um, legal aid was never available before for vaccine damage tribunals, but they broke ground and got legal aid for us so that we could have legal representation 
when we went to the Vaccine Damage Tribunal. So Robert was there in his wheelchair reading his catalogues and we had a solicitor and a barrister and a video link up to the neurologist from his medical office. Um, it was an all day of a thing, but we got through it. They made us hang on for another month before they told us the outcome, but we've been successful. And the success was based on records that had been there from the day after he was vaccinated. Nothing else had changed, it was just our team of experts, the medical and the legal, had scrutinised it and found it. So he could have been paid out a lot earlier if we'd known about it, but that's not the way it's supposed to go. So because our legal team managed to set this precedent with the tribunal system, other families now within the JABS group are pursuing that route. We're hoping by the end of the year that there'll be another one through and hopefully that will hit the headlines. Now, you may have heard of MMR and autism because that's been one of the up and downers over the, the last few years. Um, certainly, when the multi-party action was going ahead, a good 50% of the 1,400 live certificates were for suspected autism after the vaccine. And these children, when we've had these questionnaires back, the parents have reported that the child had previously been very well. And regardless of the age when the jab was given, whether it was 13 months like my son, or two and a half, or four, or even six, 15, the child had usually reacted within the incubation period, suffered symptoms and problems known to the manufacturer, but developed autistic spectrum problems, and usually had another long-term life issue like blood platelet problems, or um, epilepsy, or severe bowel problems. Now, the autism support groups said that if a child's autistic, the parent usually knows from birth there's some difference. The child isn't meeting the milestones. They're not looking at you. They don't want to um, play. They don't want to get involved. They don't want eye contact. But that's not what the families in the jobs group were saying. The Department of Health keeps saying, well, because MMR is given in the second year of life, it's all a coincidence that these children are becoming autistic in that time period. But that doesn't account for the child giving it at 13 months or two and a half or five, developing the same problems. But unfortunately, because that multi-party action failed in 2003, parents in the UK had nowhere else to go with that. The very same year that we failed in the UK, in Japan, over a thousand children were awarded damages in Japan for suffering neurological problems, epilepsy, and other issues after MMR. Because of the language issues, we've not been able to determine what the other problems were. And in places like Japan, sometimes they refer to autism as organic brain disease, so it has a different title. But I suspect that many of those Japanese children also were on the autistic spectrum. So parents have been paid out in Japan and in the United States in the last few years, we've learned that US judges have been paying out since the 90s to children that have become autistic after multiple vaccines, including MMR. Now it came to a head a few years ago because one of the parents, well, a set of parents, one was a neurologist, the dad was a neurologist, and the mum was a solicitor. And although they'd been asked to sign a gagging order, they went public with it. And because they went public about the little girl, Hannah Pauling, she'd become autistic after being given nine vaccines, including MMR. The parents went public and nobody could argue with them because he was a neurologist. And these other families then came out of the woodwork saying that we've also received payments, but we had to sign the gagging order. So from the 90s, they have been paying out. And recently, you may have come across it in the press, but we've learned that in Italy, in Italy a fellow European country, a, an Italian judge has ruled that a little boy has become autistic after an MMR vaccine. It's a Merck vaccine. We use Merck vaccines in the UK. 
The other two brands that they used were the GlaxoSmithKline vaccine, which we also use in the UK. And the third one was a withdrawn brand that contained a dodgy month strain that was also in two of our MMRs when they were first introduced. So now we've set a precedent in the European community that an Italian judge has ruled that this child has developed autistic spectrum after MMR and he's found the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Health guilty. It's they that have to award compensation to the child. One of the tactics for the Ministry of Health was to say, well, MMR isn't a compulsory vaccine in Italy, um, so why should we have to pay the parents' chores to have it? They still had exactly the same pressure that families in the UK get when we don't have a compulsory programme, but you're browbeaten and receive about 20 appointment cards through the letterbox if you don't go. But we've set a precedent. And what we've done this very week, because it's been in some of the Wigan and Lee papers, is um, we've been in touch with Andy Burnham, who's our MP, and he's also Shadow Health Minister. And he stated in the press that he wants to meet with Jams and he wants to present this information to Andrew Lansley, who's the Health Minister. So we're waiting to see what happens next. It's been a roller coaster ride, <laughs> but we go along. So that's the current situation. Now, if anyone wants to ask me anything or any points you want to discuss, I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah? yeah, you've just said Andy Burden. Andy Burden. Andy Burden is part of the Flora Nation Society in Scotland. And in him, uh, when he was what the Cal Secretary, he appointed what they call the Flora Nation of uh, Scottish Water and they signed, they signed the actual papers saying to fluoridize, to basically put f sodium fluoride in Scottish water. So to me, he's the biggest hypocrite in the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. need to consider a rubella vaccine. If they've caught rubella along the way, they won't need a rubella jab. So rubella may be redundant for, for t certainly for infants, they don't need it at all because rubella doesn't harm a child that's already here. Rubella can sometimes harm a developing fetus. So if parents are looking at the three separate vaccines, they might determine that they don't need the rubella at all. Um, it's something they can come back to perhaps if they happen to have a teenage girl but they're in a position to discuss it. The same with mumps, because mumps for children is usually innocuous. In fact, when they brought out the single vaccines in the late 60s, early 70s, the Department of Health brought in the measles jab across the board for infants between the ages of 15 months and two because they deemed that it was an illness that could be nasty. The rubella jab they ruled out across the teenage girl population, those that were just going through puberty. And I could see the sense in that. I'd still say they should have a blood test first, because many of those may be immune and don't need it. But they had a single month's jab, which the Department of Health could have rolled out across the teenage boy population, but they said that it was such a relatively mild disease, mumps, that it wasn't really necessary. But if adult males wanted it, they could have it. So I think that helps to put it into perspective. Yeah, where you can choose. That's a, that's, yeah. that's a, a, a good point. Uh, another thing, I hope you don't mind me no. asking these things, is that when we, we also get a lot of people in who've been bullied, you know, you're a bad parent, you should do this, and you know, you're putting other children at risk. And what 
we've looked at is informed consent. Yes. And yeah. when it states on informed consent that you've made up your mind, mm. through your, even if it's your, your own research, that has to be uh, accepted. Without, Absolutely. Without any argument. So nobody can then say to you, you're a bad parent. If you go in and say, I don't want MMR, or mm. I don't want PPT, or whatever, mm. that should be taken. And when we've raised that point, it's gone quiet. Mm. That's absolutely crucial for everyone because unless you're given all the information about the disease in the UK, in a well-developed country, because you might find that disease isn't actually an issue in the UK, and unless you've been given the full information that the drug company provides to the doctor, you're not making an informed consent. You are not aware of the problems on that record. You're given a glossy pamphlet, if anything which is designed to promote the product and play down any potential side effects because they're looking at the numbers game. They're saying, right, we need to get half a million children vaccinated in the fastest, most cost-effective way. And if one or two are damaged along the way, the system will mop them up and the parents will never be able to prove it anyway. So it's um, a speedy, cost-effective way because it's one vaccine, that might contain five or six different elements because brand new babies, six, uh, six week old babies now get um, a five in one and a, a single and for men's sake and when they're four months old they get the whole lot again and then five months old they get the whole lot again. <coughs> so there's more combinations closer together and um, it's very difficult for a parent or a doctor if the child does have a reaction to determine which components cause the problem or is it just a combination? Um, a couple of questions. Uh, <clears throat> obviously you've gone through this quite extensively so you'll have, you'll have been talking to neurologists and talking to doctors along the way. Um, but the first question is, uh, at any point uh, did any of these uh, doctors and health professionals ever uh, broach the topic or the understanding that um, the, or I should say the misconception that a vaccine is not necessarily an immunisation. That quite often a vaccine doesn't automatically uh, result in full immunisation. In some cases a vaccine has uh, only maybe a 30% chance of actually creating an immunisation. So, uh, yeah, no, that's a, a very good point. Uh, no, they don't. They always refer to vaccines as immunisations when until it's actually worked and made somebody immune and that's been corroborated by whatever means that they can do, um, it's still a vaccine. And um, they say themselves, and again you don't know where they get the figure from, but they say about 10% don't actually work. So that if a child does catch it after they've had a job, well that's the child that it didn't work for. They've no idea if it's not worked for everybody else either. <laughs> But it just so happens the child that's caught it is the one that it didn't work for. Yeah. 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 But you're absolutely right, and no, no health professional that's ever debated that part of vaccine and immunisation. Um, and the other point leading on from that is, uh, has there ever been any um, talk on 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 the um, the more subtle long-term effects, like as you say, like uh, the eight million children, you've had the five hundred and odd who had severe reactions. Mm few hundred, maybe a thousand or, or that had uh, uh, minor reactions. Uh, is there any evidence for more subtle uh, effects such as uh, a lowering of IQ by yeah. 10 points over the yeah. period of an entire lifespan, for instance, or the uh, 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 development of, of apathy, uh, greater, uh, a connection to um, a greater tendency towards depression in later mm -hmm. life, these sorts of things? No, it's not actually being studied by the Department of Health because if you think about it, if they're not going to investigate the severe ones, then they won't want to account for the minor ones. They'll just put that down to uh, how the parent's been reared, how the child's been reared, or single parent, or the parents haven't loved the child enough, or there's something else. But you're absolutely right. Some of the components within the vaccines have been linked with dementia, memory problems, um, uh, loss of weight, failure to thrive, cancer. Yeah, there's all kinds of issues like that. Yeah. I'm probably a bit uh, inspiratorial here. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very sceptical of that vaccine for well, especially when I hear the likes of Bill Gates at the TED conference a couple of years ago say we can control the population through vaccines. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's a very good point. Um, 
um, of scenes for those reports. I find them very disturbing. Obviously, I can't say where, uh, where Bill Gates is coming from in that, but I would say to everyone, you know, just make informed decisions, whatever you're doing. Check it out. Just go back to source. When something's being offered to you on every, any level, go back to source. And the other thing is that when we get people coming in, you know, like mums will bring the kids in and say, you know, hey, I've built it, they have measles, and I've got to tell them, because it's a contagious disease, you've got to go mm -hmm. to your doctor. Yeah. Now, with the kids being vaccinated, it's a virus. Oh, if it hasn't been yeah, vaccinated, yeah. it's measles. Yes. And that yeah. happens all the time. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's just, you know, everybody, I think anybody would know a case of measles. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult under those circumstances yeah. because, yes, they'll, t they'll talk but about we, it being something else. We do, like. we do have a GP, uh, a lady GP, just sending people to go for a vaccine. And she right. openly admits that she hasn't had it. <laughs> right. And I've got two yeah. mates who are doctors, seven kids, and none of them have been vaccinated. <laughs> Well, during the swine flu epidemic, uh, we learned that many frontline professionals were turning the vaccine down. Yeah. Um, and I think they were very good reason. They got a strike reason. in the States, didn't they? Uh, yes, they did. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And only uh, polio victim in the 50s. Sorry? Only polio victim. Oh, right. The, uh, right. And they found out now the vaccine was uh, known to be contaminated. The woman researched it, so I think the main guy. Maurice Hellerman. Pardon? Maurice Hellerman. Yeah. And, then, and, he was, and she, she was sacked. And today, there's, there's over a million people suffering from cancer from this vaccine. For it proven. Also, the, the, the seen graphs were, you see the small picture, you know, where they introduced the graph the, for the polio in the 1950s. And then it shows you the drop in the, uh, you know, in the disease. You get the bigger picture, the drop starts there. Yeah. yeah, I've seen that with, with other vaccines yeah. as well, that they move the statistics to suit what yeah. they want to say. Totally yeah. no, yeah. There was um, a 600% increase, wasn't there, in polio, in polio paralysis a year after? after the yes, it's one of the main instigators. And in the last, well, all the time we've been going, uh, which is since 94, the only case of polio in the UK mm. occurred after the vaccine. Mm. John the salt said the only known cause of polio was the vaccine. Oh, right. And he was the guy that Right. I've not seen that bit. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I think he's actually going to go on the Senate. Is there, is there a, I understand you've contributed to a book, just for oh. curious <laughs> details in the book. And yes. there should be people interested in their reading. Uh, thank you very much, yes. It's um, worth mentioning the Fear of the Invisible as well. Oh, yes. And that yeah. does actually cover the graphs that are about the polio, yeah. as well as Maurice Hillman and his links to the SB40 virus, mm. which is linked to cancer, mm. which he admitted was in the contaminated the milk <laughs> feedstock mm. that yeah. all the vaccines were actually built from. Yeah, um, definitely books to read. It's um, Janine Roberts. Again, you'll find her on the internet or you can find her off the JAMS website. So, now I'm in Israel. At Amazon, yeah. yeah. Um, that's Fear of the Invisible. And she's also done the vaccine papers. Um, she's she's too ill now. She suffered a stroke a couple of years ago, but her um, uh, uh, nieces have finished the book off for her, pulled the papers together. They're available uh, again through Amazon or the Jabs site. And the, the Jabs families have actually, and I've contributed to, the written chapters for two books called Silenced Witnesses, one and two. Uh, it covers the politics, <coughs> the um, medical side of it, the the journeys that the families have gone down. If anybody's interested, either give me your name and address, I'll, I'll organise it, or you can get them from our website <coughs> to, um, through the usual uh, jabs. Shouldn't, the, the, shouldn't this issue be in the other countries? Because it can't be like Italy, Japan, and UK. And oh, no, no, you're absolutely it right. Be like everywhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. it will be. Yeah. It's just a language barrier. Fortunately, with the internet, those barriers are coming down because people are translating and sharing. Um, but you're absolutely right, we know there's been cases in Sweden and Finland, um, it, but it's the language that's the, the issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. The families need to start working with the Autism Research Unit at Sunderland, I don't know if it's still Yes, this, we have been. Malcolm Hooper and all the sort of dietary modifications and things. Yeah, that absolutely. Working. I submitted tests for my son <coughs> to um, the Autism Research Unit in Sunderland 
with Paul Shattuck, I don't know, he may have retired now, um, but many families have found it's been helpful because it's that they've then determined to eliminate and look at the diet that yeah. the child's on. So yeah. eliminating the wheat and gluten yes. and all that sort of stuff and yeah. looking at the metabolites in the urine yeah. and things and seeing that the, yeah, the parents are desperate to try and improve the, the children's health. Yeah. Yes? I think uh, when you have parents who generally are not aware to what's going on, what tends to wake them up is when they find out sort of like preservatives and all these other things that they put in there. I mean, do you know some of the things, have you got a bit of a list of things that actually go in there, so they're terrifying? Uh, with vaccines, definitely, yeah. yes. Yeah. In fact, again, the product sheets uh, do specify what it's been cultured on, the um, antibiotics that it's in, um, lots of information, so if you need to have... I just think if you list them, people watch this video. Oh, I see, uh, right. Uh, um, um, oh, well, the list is <laughs> endless. Um, I would suggest, again, going to the, the JABS website. We have um, a box on, on the homepage that says the vaccines. If people click on there, that will take them to the product information leaflets. So that's that's jabs.org.uk. That's there. right, jabs.org.uk. Thank you. All these vaccines are obviously yeah. well read, well researched. How long on average would it take for them to develop a vaccine for, say, measles, bumps, or rubella? A single one? Uh, well, the single ones are out, were out before the combined. Yeah, the single vaccines were used in the UK from 67 to 88, and onwards actually, because it was run alongside the MMR um, before then. Um, the singles still carry a risk of side effects. Um, you need to study the product sheet for them as well, but if a parent wants to go down that route, then they are available. Yeah, that, that's not actually what I was asking. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, perhaps I worded it wrong. You mentioned swine flu. Right. Now, when swine flu was identified, uh, wherever it was, Mexico or mm -hmm. something like that, within months, we had a vaccine for it. <laughs> yes. And the reason I'm asking you how long does it take, I've read in on certain websites and books and things, it can take years to develop a vaccine. Um, and the tests that they have to run through before they can let it out on the general public. And well, yet the swine flu vaccine was... Yeah. Had, like uh, officially it had a special license. It was allowed through because apparently flu jabs are very safe. And therefore on the back of that, replacing... The, the little elements to, that's to do with the swine flu aspect for the other flu aspects would be fine, you can just swap it over. <laughs> um, I don't agree with that at all. And we did criticise um, not only the Department of Health but the World Health Organisation for sanctioning the speed of that. At what point did the UK government actually take responsibility for the effects? Was it during the MMR, the one they reported from Japan? Um, Where they give. In, immunity, if you yes. like, should be bad, bad words to solve this, uh, to the actual pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, we've, we've learned, again, with hindsight, many years down the line, but we've learned that um, the MMR manufacturers were given an indemnity against um, lawsuits. Mm. Um, we didn't know that when we were pursuing a lawsuit oh. against them, but it would have come out at some point. The European um, for the as well as just the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, indirectly, yes. And um, we found that out with the swine flu jab, and there's another one as well, I can't just think what it is, it might be the flu jab. But yeah, um, there is indemnities um, for the drug companies, particularly when they're trying to push some, when the uh, Department of Health are trying to push something through quickly. So uh, with regard to like the swine flu, um, there would have been contracts in place. There was, and we gave it to a company called Baxter. Oh yeah, Baxter, yes. We were under investigation for crimes against mankind. Oh my At the God. same time they give the vaccine and allow them to bring it into the country. And guess what the crimes were? What were the crimes? They'd allowed a live vaccine to go into 18 different countries. So they, would have started they produced 72 oh. kilograms yeah. of this yeah. contaminated yeah. that start three live viruses yeah. in it. I've seen some of the paperwork online, but I've never not <coughs> come back to see if there's anything to confirm with that. There was a case in New Zealand, I believe, who was actually taking that to court. Yeah, there was a, there was a lady in Czechoslovakia, I think, who yeah. found it out and she was going to take them. Well, she did actually take them to it, but she never got uh, anywhere. So.
I spent uh, some months in Bolivia where the vaccine uh, is, any vaccine is pretty much limited to those that can afford it rather than those that deserve it. So you have yellow fever, tuberculosis, TB and uh, hepatitis, it's all quite endemic, it's horrible. Uh, with that in mind, in, in this country, is the system guilty of applying the same importance to, for example, TB, to the MMR, to sell units? Are they talking up the MMR to make it seem like it's be or and end all? Do you have to have it because it's so important mm. when it's not as important as others? Well, again, I think you've hit the nail on the head because one, once they started on the serious diseases like diphtheria, tetanus, polio, and they found that there was a market for them and obviously people wanted to protect individuals against those three deadly diseases or potentially deadly diseases. They then turned their attention to other diseases. And once you bring a vaccine out, you've got to promote it, which means you've got to change the status of that disease in people's minds. So where in the 50s and 60s, they used to have measles parties, and when they brought out the single measles jab, as I mentioned in 67, there was only about a 50% uptake of that because most parents had seen measles, weren't really worried about it. With the live polio vaccine, because people were aware of people that had been injured by it, they were queuing up to get the polio vaccine. But with the measles jab, 50%. 50% uptake, people weren't really bothered about it. They used to have measles parties and get it out of the way before the child became an adult. But you're absolutely right. Once you've got that vaccine, you've got to promote it. And we saw some information about um, chicken pox because um, waiting in the wings is a measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox combination. And one doctor was reported, well a professor was reported in the, the press saying that chicken pox harms more people than all the other diseases put together. Now, everybody I think knows somebody who's had chicken pox and yes, if the individual has got some problem with their immune system, it can be dodgy. Um, Robert caught chicken pox when he was little and he was in a bad way. But um, for most people who are healthy, it's just another rite of passage. It's a sales pitch. It's a sales pitch, yes. And it's clever because they have, uh, it's just like any kind of supermarket fine, if you, if you don't mind the uh, me metaphor, it's, it's just like any supermarket finest brand. Everyone buys that when they can afford it because it's what's to be expected. Mm. And that's why people go for the MMR, probably because it's what it's expected. Everyone, as you say, browbeats you into doing it, get the letters mm. from the post. Uh, parents of other kids that already have it, perhaps put pressure on you. It's, it's, it's just really good, uh, if you excuse the phrase again, it's a really good sales pitch. Well, yeah, even if it goes wrong, yeah. they still want to market for it. When they brought in three brands of MMR in 88, two of those brands were found to be causing mumps meningitis. And after four years, our Department of Health banned it, withdrew it. But the two drug companies, because they've got all these vaccines, they sold them to Brazil. And they did a mass inoculation program in Brazil. And lo and behold, there was a huge outbreak of mumps meningitis in those children. And I read a report that one of our public health officials had written saying, we've got to be careful when we do mass concentrated vaccination programs because side effects can show up. And you think, well, we don't want side effects. <laughs> but these drug companies have knew there was a problem with the vaccine, but still sold it to Brazil. And if we're having a hard time proving the MMR caused damage, what hope is um, a Brazilian parent against Merck and Glaxo? Mm -hmm. Just going back to a comment, really, about drug development. I, I was involved a little bit of time at um, AstraZeneca's Central Toxicology Laboratory. And the time scales to develop a drug of many years from sort of tissue culture so studies right through animals into humans. And I don't agree with any of it, by the way. I only worked there for a short time as a student. But um, a lot of the drugs are coming off patent these days. So this is where the money's going into vaccines because they can't make it off the drugs anymore. They're really pushing the vaccines. <coughs> they went back a bit conspiratorial like Dave. You've got the eugenics program of all the people like Bill Gates and all the rest of them. They've been caught putting sterilants in the vaccines and all sorts of things. 
World Health Organization, United Nations, the developing countries where they want to start sterilizing and getting rid of the weaker gene population and culling everybody and, and the kind of long-term effects that are hard to prove. So I personally don't trust any of them anymore, even if any of them ever did have efficacy at all. There's so much corruption in there that I would never, you know, wear anything they imagine. It's a UN agenda, isn't it? Yeah, I mean... The agenda 21. Have you heard of the agenda 21, Jack? Yeah. No, no. Right. No. Uh, United Nations Convention 92 was in uh, Rio de Janeiro. They uh, agreed what was called Agenda 21 and the Fools in Wigan Council, you find the European Constitution, they have uh, uh, they feel support Agenda 21 as part of the Constitution. So you've agreed to that, guys. Has anyone asked? No. You actually read Agenda 21, it's, a, it's an appalling document, and you might find the triggers for what you're experiencing in that Agenda 21. I talk to population reduction. It's a sustainable development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's sustainable development. It's, yeah. Okay. The population of seven billion at the present, they want a population of five hundred billion. Well, again, that's conspiracy. It's conspiracy theory. I don't know about theory. I mean, they're missing their own policy documents. Well, that is. They don't. They You were put in the the spot, a young couple. And who maybe didn't have the education, maybe didn't have the knowledge. Uh, we get a lot of misinformation about about this. You see, educated uh, uh, consent, Jay, and you're put in the spot and asked what you would do, what you would advise, and what would you say to them? I would tell the parent to go back to source to find out about the actual diseases, yeah. and one way to access accurate information about illnesses in the UK is to pick up medical textbooks that were published in the 60s yeah. before the vaccines came out because those medical textbooks when they're describing diseases like scarlet fever, whooping cough, measles because they haven't got the vaccines at that time they've no reason to hype them up usually it's just describing it as it is so that's the first point with regard to the actual illnesses <coughs> and then the second point is to get hold of the drug product sheets, which should be freely available from the GP, practice nurse, chemist, even online. But get hold of the product sheet, not the glossy pamphlet, because that product sheet is the drug company's get out of jail card. It tells you what's in the vaccine, when it shouldn't be given, and the side effects that they know are associated with that product. And if it's on there, it means it's happened. And then the third element is the child's own medical situation. There may be very good reason why a vaccine isn't actually appropriate for an individual child, but the doctor hasn't picked up on it, the nurse hasn't, or whatever. And when the Department of Health keep talking about herd immunity, wanting to get 90% of the population uh, vaccinated to try and protect those that can't be, given the jab for whatever reason, they're not highlighting, not helping to identify the child that shouldn't have something for a medical reason, let alone any other reason. There may be a very good reason they may have a, an antibiotic allergy and there's antibiotic in the vaccine. They may have an egg allergy and it's cultured on egg. So they're the three main elements. Um, the medical textbooks from the 60s, the drug product sheets, and then the child's and family's medical history. But remembering all the way down the line that in the UK, nothing is compulsory. So they have a right to look at everything and keep going and keep going until they're happy that they're making an informed consent. So the situation consent. would be default, no, until you're convinced otherwise. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, because we know that children are being given jobs when they're premature, when they're, they've not even reached the proposed birth date. They're being given half a dozen vaccines, and it's uh, it's very can worrying. I, can I just uh, ask a question about the, the, the social aspect of uh, of this? Have you ever come across uh, families uh, or, or couples who, who, who've had children who refused outright to have vaccinations? As, as I'm, I'm, I intend to do with my baby to come, um, I don't want any vaccinations at all. Um, mm -hmm. And um, what I'm worried about is that. Social, the SS social services will come in <laughs> and use that as an excuse to put a foot in the door and potentially along somewhere along the line uh, uh, 
to, to attempt to try and take that child uh, away from us. Right. Well, Have you ever come across that? Yeah, we've come across it, and in some cases, it's even gone to court when um, a couple have been getting divorced, mm -hmm. and the father wants to give, and the mother doesn't want to give, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And usually, if it's got to that situation, the judge has ruled in favour of giving the child everything. So your best There's line, <laughs> yeah, your best line of defence is to have a partner that's in full agreement to you. Yes. Um, when the Department of Health or any medical officer approaches you, you do not have to justify your decision because they're not compulsory. So you can keep a smile on your face and say, "We're still considering it. Thank you very much." Um, and just keep considering it. <laughs> Must they receive your permission to do this? Sorry? Must they receive your permission? Which um, is saying some of these are being given very early after birth. Yeah, some are given, some are actually given the day the baby's actually born. Um, sometimes the mother, when she's just delivered a baby, is given a rubella jab. Yeah. Um, because they're saying, well, she's definitely not pregnant and she needs to be immune for her next baby. But what they're forgetting is she may be breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And whatever goes through can come through. I don't think they forget, and I think it's, it's so. <laughs> I think it's designed yeah. that way. I mean, the first thing you do is stick with it to bring Kay. Yes, yeah. You know, um, yeah. But if you're, you're forewarned, then you can be forearmed. Um, if you've got like a birth plan in order, and you and your partner have decided 100% before you actually go into there, then you're not caught by surprise. They will want to offer vitamin K. Um, they may want to ho offer hepatitis B jab, depending on where you live. And then when the baby's six weeks old, they want to give lots more. Can we give them a legal notice? Um, I would suggest that you, do, you don't, don't need to do anything proactive. You just need to say, thank you very much, but we're thinking about it. Well, my, my worry is, is that we'll give it... I, I, you hear about these cases where they don't even ask. Not that just you come in you, and they can prove that you're insane. Or, or, or the, if they can prove that you're judge not to be able to make the right decision, they'll make it for you. But if you turn around and say to them, I've done my own research, just by the fact that you're doing your own research shows that you're not, you know, off your box. And I have made my decision and I am using my right of informed consent. And you can't do anything, they've got to leave you. Yeah, the same with, if you're going into hospital <coughs> to have a baby, you could say you're dealing with that with your doctor. And that way they're off the, the, the hook, oh. they should be leaving you their own and you can come back to it when you're in a better environment. But yes, we have heard of um, couples going to the doctor to talk about a vaccine and the baby's been a bit fractious on the mum's knee and the nurse has said, I'll play with the child outside. And then the child has come back, oh well, you're here to have your vaccines, aren't you? And we've given them. Um, we, we, I've heard of that. <laughs> They say that just saying enough gives consent. Yes, they do. If you're there, <laughs> yeah, but it's not. And I would just say, guard your baby <laughs> with your life. <laughs> the, the GP practices are being incentivised to do all these things oh, yeah. as well. Yes. Under all these quaff targets and all sorts of things. I hear of GPs, I know quite a lot of GPs that work with them, who say they'll strike patients off the list if they don't take part and all the rest of it. They will go to that extreme, some of them. Uh, it messes up their statistics at their practice, you know. I was quoted about one in Bolton the other day that there's a big travelling community nearby Little Lever and the GP practices have a nightmare because they won't be vaccinated. It's a conflict of interest, that though, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely. It's a scheme, isn't it? They're just yeah. front, front desk drum pushers for the drug companies. There is a video out there uh, I watched a while back in Australia. It's talking about the, the, the vaccines and there's a, quick, it's a, quick, a strong opposition to it. Yes. There's one doctor, doctor in particular refused to have his village, a small town. Yes, yes. Anyway, you hear the story, yeah? Yes. And he went away holiday, the, 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 the local doctor, when he got the kids vaccinated, mm -hmm. and his, the kids before that had less incidents of, of, of illnesses than the kids in the surrounding towns who had been actually uh, mm -hmm. uh, been vaccinated. Yeah. So he was using that, but the local doctor came in and uh, got the kids vaccinated. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. If you want to play with them, ask them the difference between the side effect and the test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To explain what is a side effect and what's an effect, mate, you know. Mm -hmm. There's no good difference, it's all effects. I think it's this hidden in plain view thing as well with yeah. the product sheets. They're telling you to your face 
and people are choosing not to look at that information. So they've got, the, you know, well, we did tell you, and it's mm -hmm. there, that information. Well, you, you want to look at it. Some of the things we've found that is that the nurses who are the people actually doing the bypass and they're not the ones that are there. The job is just to give a vaccine. They don't have any knowledge about it. No, and that's true. My wife asked them what I said to her when she, she said to Rosa that um, she was being irresponsible by not having the vaccine. She said, okay, tell me what's in it. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, what? She said, tell me what's in it. And she couldn't, so Rosa told her what was in it. And in the end, she said, please stop. <laughs> I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> I, I uh, did translation for NHS and uh, was present during the jobs given to kids and everything and was present when the doctors were talking to the mothers and everything. And what I've noticed, um, one thing is that uh, the doctors, usually the mothers are young, you know, and they are like, the listening to what the doctor says. The doctor says, it has to be done, has to be done. And normally the reaction of the mothers is like, yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. And especially when the mothers are foreigners, they don't know the system, they don't no. understand anything. No. And what I've noticed is that um, the, the jobs were given to the children that were born here. This is one thing. But they also, what is interesting, that some mothers would come, like like Czech mothers, I think Czech, uh, they would come with the baby, like five months old, three months old, whatever. And uh, uh, the, the nurse will come into the house, will look at the baby, da da da, says, you know, if, what jobs? They, they did they have any jobs in the country where you, where you live? The mother said, well, yes, uh, I translate. Then they say, well, we still don't know what your jobs are. We still have to give you our jobs. And this poor child ended up having like a double portion of stuff, you know, which I, I, I was like shocked when, you know, they were saying this and everything. And sometimes I would even in Czech would say just, no, but you probably, don't you think you should kind of insist that you had your ch child or just put down which jobs exactly that, you know, they had. But quite often what I've noticed, the young mothers like don't even remember these things. No, no. You know, they don't follow, especially as you said, when somebody just delivered, uh, they can't remember things, they just only think about this baby, you know, no, just to feed doctor. him and everything. They don't follow mm. these things, right? Yeah. And, and uh, this is what, what happens in here. And another thing is that I also uh, was present uh, during the justification of children. Yes. <laughs> 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 surgery. And uh, uh, it's, it's actually, for, for in, in my case, I, I've noticed it's just like a, a line. Next child, next child, yeah. next child, bum, next child, bum, next child. Like, you know, they literally don't even ask a lot of things there. No. Which is like, uh, it's amazing how quickly they just do it and just dismiss you, you know. And uh, the, the, it's not like, oh, this is the name, you're the mother bomb, you know, and everything. And uh, the only thing is just what is told, the mother told uh, before the job, your child may develop some fever. That's it. I've never ever, I've translated for several years, I've never heard anything that you said mm -hmm. while, while I was translating about the child that needs to have this job. Mm -hmm. That's been one of our main criticisms with the cervical cancer jab that's offered in schools to teenage girls because they just line them all up. And because the girls are now 14, 15, if the parent has refused consent for the vaccine, some of the nurses have taken the girl to one side, in front of a mate, but to one side and said, do you know you're the only one that's going to get cancer because your mum's refused this vaccine? And do you know you can sign your own consent form and uh, to override what your mum said? And they're using the, like, the sexual rules where a, a girl over 14 can get um, independent um, contraceptive advice without a parent's knowing. They're using that rule to allow the girls to sign for the, the vaccine themselves. And those girls don't want to be shamed in front of the peer group and but are not in a position to actually make an informed consent. Can I ask a question? Yeah. How, do you know how many families don't vaccinate their children by right now in the case? There's this amazing number of families that don't vaccinate I don't that's believe that's, that information will be available because quite a lot of people will just keep quiet about it because they don't want to be hassled. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes families have said they feel like they're the odd one out 
and she raised it and made to feel like um, a very strange person, but there's probably a lot of people there, and certainly we get contacted every day by people who want to exercise a choice, and sometimes they choose not to give anything, so that's right. For what would be your guess? What do you think? Thousands? Um, Ten thousand, hundred thousand? Probably the comps. Give a figure. I know there's a, there's a group called the Informed Parent, and that's a group for parents who've chosen either not to vaccinate at all, or to be very selective, um, they may, I and mean, you could check their website, you might have something along those lines. Yeah. It, 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 can I have another question? Uh, you know what you know now. If 20 years ago you knew what you know now, would you have vaccinated your channel? Uh, that's a tricky one, because uh, you're looking at some of the diseases which were dangerous, more dangerous in the UK 20 years ago, like diphtheria, which are virtually non-existent in Britain now. Um, so it would only really be necessary if you were going to a country that's endemic with diphtheria. Um, tetanus. Tetanus is uh, an illness that can very rarely be picked up through contaminated soil. Uh, but you're talking about a serious puncture wound that's deep rather than a graze and it's generally something that starts to heal over before it's been cleaned properly or it's not bled properly. Um, but currently if somebody is affected by a deep wound, uh, like anyone in this room, if you went to A&E they would offer you immunoglobulin infusions which would deal with any suspected tetanus germ. Um, with a young baby I mean, if my son's just got married, if he, planned, if he goes on to, well, it would be his wife that would have the baby. <laughs> um, we'd be looking at each one individually and making a decision over each bit. There certainly wouldn't be any one-size-fits-all policy. But certainly that's where I would suggest that each one is ruled out or ruled in. And personally, there's more being ruled out than ruled in. Um, again, because we're in the UK. As it seems, uh, the government's stance on vaccines is pro, pro-vaccine. Um, children in the care system, I take it, are... I mean, it might be outside your sphere of knowledge, but I'm, I'm guessing that the children in the care system in the UK are automatically immunised. Um, is that something you know? Um, we've come across that where children have been taken into care, um, and then sometimes a guardian has contacted us, but usually, if it's a foster parent, uh, they've got to go along with whatever the Department of Health says the child should have because they're required, um, supposedly, in the best interest of the child. Um, it's only if you've got parental rights that you're in a position to... If you're a parent, you've got a choice. If you're a foster parent, you have no choice. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a grey area. You'd have to seek legal advice. But I know now that our son has moved into adulthood, um, our position as parents has gone down a step, the local health authority has actually got some say in what happens with our boy. Now we're adamant that he's not to have any spine flu jabs, flu vaccines, things like that. And what we've been advised by social services is that they will take our point of view into consideration. Um, and that's as far as they've gone. Um, so it is a a funny situation, yeah. it's one that you've got to keep a, a watching brief on because um, even now, usually at the British Medical Association's annual meeting, which is usually about July, uh, they always raise the subject of shall we make vaccines compulsory? Now usually we're able to come back and shout it down, but it's something to keep raising a flag about. Uh, if we can make it compulsory, uh, link it to child benefits, people don't get the child benefits if they don't vaccinate, um, let's make sure they can't access school unless they've met all the vaccine requirements um, and we've got to fight that at every step. Um, they've actually done this in America where they have a compulsory program and we could not believe it because a few years ago um, armed police went into one town to round up children that have not been vaccinated. Um, if you Google it, you'll find it on the internet. Um, it was in one of the big news programs. 
and we couldn't believe it in this day and age that um, American citizens would be treated that way. Um, so if it ever comes up, it would be a good thing to support, to shout down. <laughs> just a, a, a question, just a, you, you mentioned this organisation, JABS. Can you give us a bit more information about who they are and what, what, what they do? Well, all right, well JABS <coughs> is the group that we formed. Um, it stands for Justice, Awareness, Basic Support. And the main aims and objectives have been to try and uh, get recognition and justice for the child that's been affected, to raise awareness so that new parents can hopefully make safer choices, and then offer basic support at whatever level we can to a family that's child's already been affected. Because uh, if the child is damaged, it's every level that you need information about. It's on the medical front because the child's in and out of hospital, it's the therapy front because you're trying to suggest treatments, therapies that have worked. And um, the families within our group uh, are trying absolutely everything we have as a family with our boy. Um, on the education front, you're fighting to get special needs. Um, so we try and support on that level, make sure parents know what benefits they might be entitled to. Um, and then once a child has gone through the school system, trying to find out what happens to that child then. Um, I know that the families within the group are concerned about what's going to happen to the adult when they're no longer fit and able to actually um, look after them. Um, I know with those we don't want our boy to end up in some kind of a care facility. Can you apply for an enduring power of attorney or lasting power of attorney? Um, yeah, the, the money side of it isn't an issue. Um, I'm an appointee for whatever money Robert gets. Um, as he gets older, we might have to turn some of that over to his brothers. Um, but it's the care pa part of it, really. We don't want him ending up in some kind of a care facility. If you, I mean, my understanding is if you apply for lasting for attorneys, it's called now, uh, that gives you, you've just signed over as a decision maker. You speak for your, your son's behalf. Uh, well, yeah. And everything wrong. And everything, yeah. But that's actually really hard to get. We have, I have, I'm, I've got power of attorney over my auntie. Yeah. Really, really hard to get. Yeah, no you, have, you, you have to jump through so many hoops. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. To yeah. the point where it puts the person at a dis the person who needs your help at a disadvantage. Okay. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. I know some of the families have gone down the route of power attorney mm. for their child. Uh, we've not crossed that road yet with our son uh, because so far all the way along the line, um, he's not had any sort of capacity to sign over anything to us um, because. Well, he's like a 14 month old. Um, but it's the physical side of it really that um, we want to try and keep him in our home so he's not injured in another way by being taken away from the only family that he knows. Um, but it's the practicalities of looking after somebody when you start becoming infirm yourself. I'm hoping that's not for a while, but <laughs> um, we've, we've got to sort of look to the future for him. Um, we're trying to get a set up in our home where we can get carers coming in continually um, round the clock to help look after him, but um, it's a, a slow, laborious system. <laughs> How did you find the awareness now? Is it, is it improved and is there anybody actually, are you getting more help now from I suppose, the political side as well? Is it still the same for those doors? Um, that's been an up and down all over. Um, over the years, we've had many meetings with Department of Health officials who just want to blank you and get you out of the room as quickly as possible and uh, pay lip service to what you've said. Um, that's why we've always turned to the newspapers as much as possible, the press, because the press have usually been very good at covering the parents' accounts. Um, to, to raise awareness that way. But um, in the last few years we've seen a change there as well and we think the Department of Health PR machine is going into overdrive to try and suppress stories because when we've, we've taken powerful stories to the press recently over, for example, the cervical cancer vaccine and we found that um, the journalists, although they're initially interested, can't get it past the editors to, uh, to get it published. So we certainly feel that you know there's something going on behind the scenes. Yeah, it sounds like actually that sounds does sound like common purpose. If you a word of that expression. Rob. Another thing. Look up on internet. Uh, common purpose. Look up on internet. 
uh, it's, a, yeah, it's, a, it's a round it's table easy. think tank. It's supposed to be a charitable organisation, but it, uh, it installs people in certain positions of power. Yeah. Right. There is a, some look up yourself on the internet. Right. Uh, yeah. As you said, the, the Neary and Hilling, the Heary, Neary, sorry, start again, the Neary versus Hillington case last year, did that have any effect? Are you aware of that? Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. That's the one where there was a similar story was the disabled, was the disabled uh, uh, youngster and uh, the, the, the Hillington Council decided to withdraw, uh, a, 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 I think it was all a part of the, the, the care facility for him. So the, the family took it to court and they won the case and the court, the judge, whose name escapes me at this point in time, the judge uh, declared in his findings that the, the role of the council is one, to investigate, two, customer services support, hence why all our councils now have got a group, a section called customer services support in the back of that hearing, and uh, to report to the court. That's the role of a, court, of a, of a council. Right, no, okay, so it's, it's, it's a Neary versus a Linden case. It should go on, you, you, should, you should be not going to You know, you, you've sort of encountered indifference, so you've had to push for everything. But have you noticed any sort of nefarious influences in your campaigning, or, you know, where it's been direct attacks on you? Yeah, direct attacks on your yeah. people or you. Uh, there, there are trolls on the internet who call me all sorts of horrible names. And my husband doesn't agree with all of them. <laughs> um, and the, uh, I've seen some of it's a, a group called the Bad Science Group. Oh. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of them. Goldacre. <laughs> yeah, Ben Goldacre from The Guardian. And um, uh, yeah, they've said awful things about me and, and everything else. And many of the families that's working within the group. Um, and they're always negative and I know that they run campaigns where something appears in the press that's supportive, they actively say on the site, let's all write now to the editor and tell him what a bad job he's done. Um, and they encourage each other on how to, to word the letters so they get maximum impact. Um, I know with the BBC, whenever MMR was mentioned, the BBC would come to us for an interview um, for many, many years. And uh, they actually put on their website, let's campaign against the BBC, let's um, contact them, bombard them with letters to say, why are you always linking to the JAD site whenever you talk about MMR? And we've noticed now that the BBC no longer makes a direct link to the, the JAD's website. So they, they can be effective. Um, I know with newspapers, they've sometimes written to the journalist and they've written to the editor to say, your journalist has done uh, beep, 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 report, and do you know that he's all wrong and you should be sacking him and all the rest of it. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of pressure. Do you think it's almost taboo to question uh, the um, yeah. vaccinations? Do you think it's taboo to say, do we need these? Mm -hmm. Oh, it is absolutely a taboo yeah. subject. I mean, we've raised it with many health professionals over the years who've seen our boy, and um, one has said, uh, it doesn't really matter what's caused it, let's get on with fixing it. Um, another one has said, why are you banging your head against the brick wall? You'll never get anywhere. Um, one has said off the record, yeah, the measles part probably did cause an inflammation in his brain, uh, but it would probably been like this if he caught measles. So there's a lot of pressure to put you down, keep you down, move you away, and yet these are the people that are seeing the hardcore cases. Um, my beef really is at consultant level. Uh, with family GPs, they're not really seeing the hardcore cases because if a child suffers a major reaction, it's usually A and E that see the child rather than the family doctor. And the family doctor just gets a report from A and E about what they've done or seen to with that child. So the, the doctor doesn't really see the major problem. But I know with us, with, uh, with Robert, when he had the initial reaction, um, I immediately raised with the A&E doctor that he'd just been given these vaccines and could it now be causing what we're seeing here, this massive seizure? And um, without even thinking about it, he just said, no, no, it won't be anything to do with that. And he shrugged it off. Now, we found with hindsight that the Department of Health officials know that the measles part can cause a seizure six to 12 days after it's given and this was 10 days. Now, if we can find that out with hindsight, he should have known that. Mm -hmm. And maybe there may have been some antiviral treatment that
could have helped Robert to minimise the damage at that point. But you, your life is in their hands. Parents are asking the right questions of the right people, but they're being fobbed off. Um, I've actually had one consultant that our boy was under, and we, had, we took several calls from families whose children were under the same consultant. And these parents had reported that, like my boy, who reacted 10 days after, they said their child had reacted um, 7, 8, 9, 10 days after the vaccine with seizures. And he had told them that was too long after to be anywhere related to the vaccine. And again, the public health laboratories have said that's exactly the time frame when it should be. So either he's ignorant or he's covering something up. He doesn't want to be. Again, the action against these gay sisters is dealing with gross misconduct or negligence. Well, he's proven it, that's the trouble, because you've got parents telling you things. And then it's your word against the doctors. If the doctor said it to us direct, <coughs> um, then you could. But um, sometimes you just want to give them a good handbagging. <laughs> there and then, rather than take it any further. Um, we wanted to support us with a vaccine damage claim, and they didn't want to know, they, they want to put their heads down. One of the consultants said, um, although he was a consultant of many years' experience dealing with children exactly like our son, he said to give an opinion on our son, even though he knew he was perfectly well up to the vaccine being given, because all his records show that, that he'd have had to have known Robert from birth to give a medical opinion. And uh, that's nonsense. Mm. And you were to try and save that from the other mitigating factors here as well. <laughs> yeah. That's all yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's right. There's, when the, there's nothing that's been found, um, he actually showed us some of the MRI scans and said uh, if these two areas in Robert's brain had been malformed or um, a different size to each other, we could have categorically said it wasn't the vaccine. And we're saying, well, they're not. They're exactly the right size and shape. Does that mean the opposite? No, no, I can't say that. So they twist and turn and twist and turn. And uh, they wear you down because really you want you don't want to antagonise that person because you're wanting that person to treat your son that's needing help. Um, so it becomes like a catch twenty two. You have to work with these people whether you want to or not sometimes. Mm. A quick, quick question for you, the box question. If you were Prime Minister tomorrow you could be one war would it be? Oh my goodness. <laughs> There's so many things I'm interested in. <laughs> we'll give you two then. That's not supposed to be the way on the system work. On the vaccine front, the first thing would be to um, reinstate individual vaccines completely across the board um, on the NHS because it's abhorrent that if you were to hurt yourself and the doctor says you need a tetanus booster, you as an adult would have to have a four in one diphtheria, whooping cough, hip. Um, if you, as an adult man, was concerned about um, catching mumps because there was a rare risk of um, infertility, you'd have to have an NMR. And if an adult woman wants to be sure that she's, well not wants to be sure, but wants to have a rubella jab, she would have to have an MMR, regardless of whether she'd have measles and mumps as a kid. Um, and that's ridiculous. The only reason why it's in combinations is because the patent has expired on the single doses and it's not cost effective for the pharmaceutical companies. The profits for the pharmaceutical companies lies in new, bigger combinations. And they've got a ready market for it and they can sell it to the doctors because it's one vaccine against seven, eight different viruses. So again, look at where the money's coming from. Who's behind that? It's always the case. Mm. It's always the case. And the other one would be world peace. The short-term goal would be to provide a full range of choice and full information, and that should be freely available to you, so that anyone talking about any vaccine doesn't have to go hunting around for it. That you're automatically. Uh, told, uh, given accurate information about the diseases in the UK, we're not a third world country, 
and other ways of looking after yourself if you caught one of those diseases, because now with the advent of antibiotics and other things, um, better nutrition and looking after yourself, caring for someone, these diseases are not the same as they were at the turn of the last century, when you had eight children sharing a damp room in cold conditions and they couldn't afford to get a doctor in and there was no food to give the child. Um, so certainly it would be full information about the diseases currently in the situation that you're in, full information about the vaccine, so you're not paying, playing Russian roulette and finding out after the event that the problem you're living with now is actually there on that paper, but not in the pamphlet that you're making a decision on. And um, there needs to be an investigation to certainly to pick up on all the side effects that are actually occurring. Um, I had a conversation with the Medicines Health Regulatory Authority, one of the bodies that deals with the yellow cards, and I said to this officer, when a yellow card actually lands on your desk with a suspected reaction, what do you actually do? And that stumped him for a start. He was like, what do you mean when it arrives? What do I do? And I said, well, what do you physically do with that piece of paper? And he said, well, if it says something like febrile convulsion, and we know febrile convulsions are linked with many, many vaccines, we tick it off on a box and that's an end to it. And I said, well, how do you know that it is actually febrile convulsion? Maybe the doctor got it wrong because they did with Alboy. Do you follow up six months later to find out if that child, it was just a febrile convulsion, nothing else has happened to him, or whether he's actually suffered neurological problems and he's having fits regularly? No, we don't automatically follow up because we know about the febrile convulsion. So there's no fail-safe system. Some arbitrary person is determining that that's just that, gone. So if these reactions are not coming in, because the doctor's saying, well, it's nothing to do with the vaccine, as they did with us, nobody's officially hearing about it anyway, and because it's not officially landing on anyone's desk, or if it does, it's dismissed, it doesn't get entered into what we call the epidemiological statistics, which is large-scale studies of data. If that adverse reaction isn't suspected as an adverse reaction in the data, when they're looking through the data, they've got no information on side effects. So it's never going to get to the bottom of it. So it should be compulsory. If they want to offer a vaccine, you should have all the information, know about what the disease is, and if a reaction occurs, it should be automatically investigated and followed up on until they're absolutely sure no person has actually been harmed. And if they have been harmed, that needs to be investigated thoroughly and not made so it's the parent that's got to work it all out for themselves and take on the system on absolutely every level. The system was actually constructed to, to hide the data. Yes. It's not actually, as I say, there's no, yeah. no um, there's, is there any way a campaign to actually get that st structure changed? Is, is there anybody in, in the authorities you've spoken to who agree that's, that's wrong and should be changed? Is there anybody um, fighting your corner? Um, do you know about it? Um, do you know in, in 1974, um, when the Vaccine Damage Payment Act was being debated through Parliament, um, Jack Ashley, he became Lord Ashley, he was the, the guy that campaigned for people with disabilities, he was deaf. Mm -hmm. um, he gave a, an excellent debate in the House of Commons and, and stated what we're saying right now, that the monitoring system of side effects does not work. And he said they are conducting a mass vaccination programme without any safety data. And that still holds true. And. Um, it was because of his efforts, and a, a similar group to ours, but in the 70s, that the Vaccine Damage Payment Act was actually passed through Parliament. And that was because children were being damaged with the whooping cough jab and the smallpox, and some with the polio vaccine. But if you talk to any doctor now, they will say that was a myth. That the children weren't really <coughs> damaged, it was because of some false reporting that uh, people were rejecting the whooping cough vaccine and there were outbreaks of whooping cough. And what you're hearing in the press now, that the MMR damage is a myth caused by this uh, rogue doctor who was just out for making some money himself. 
And um, because of his work, there's measles outbreaks because people are boycotting the vaccine. So they're, they're very good at doing this turnaround. It's a big wheel. And whichever <coughs> vaccine is being criticised, they've got the answers for it and they found out it's worked. And the hard part of it is that where the whooping cough families broke a lot of ground, but it took them many years, you don't know about them until you're actually in a similar situation yourself. And you started from scratch. So it's um, it self perpetuates, unfortunately. And what we've been trying to do is is keep the awareness going. Um, fortunately, the MMR issue has kept in the media in one way or another for the last 20 years. So we feel we have actually been quite effective in that way. In fact, it's still in the press this week. Um, it's, it's a real David and Goliath situation because you've got the parents down there dealing with children that have been harmed against the might of the Department of Health and the government propaganda machine and the pharmaceutical companies who don't want it to be anything to do with them. Mm. Oh. So you end up just a casualty? Pardon? You just end up being casualty. Just yes, yes, yes. Minority, mi minor casualty of the wonderful big thing is a job. Uh, yes, that's it. They want to promote all the the good. All mm -hmm. all vaccines are good, and all side effects are a coincidence. Mm. That's the way they're. <laughs> do you find? I mean, do you find the, the attacks in the sites and mm. the trolls have that, has that become more frequent, or is it less frequent? Or? Um, I would say it's probably stayed about the same, um, and we, do, we just have to. Live I with suppose they appear as soon as a story breaks or yes. something, they're really yeah. on, on the case straight away. Yeah, they are, and it's they're criticising and doing whatever they can to um, pull it down. Um, fortunately, over the years, we've built up um, a number of contacts with the press, um, and because we've met them and they, they know what we're about, um, usually, if it's something strong, like this business with the Italian case, you can get it into the press. It went in the a mail on Sunday, uh, sorry, the Independent on Sunday, and it went in the Daily Mail. They're both available online if anyone wants to read them, um, because it is a major breakthrough. Um, but the, they are all powerful. Do you, do you find can. anybody who has, has actually got any backbone enough to stand up to these people? Anybody that's in any position of power to do anything? Um, again, it's a difficult one because, um, as I mentioned before, when you ask the, the medical profession whose own children have been affected, because you think they were, a consultant would be in a good position to be taken uh, in a credible way, that he wants to protect his pension. Um, while from a money point of view, I can see the reason for that, but my son and his son, to me, is far more important mm -hmm. than, than that. Because also, it's the other children that follow. Yeah. Um, when we had that meeting in 97, um, when I came out of it, I was thinking, well, we've done our bit. They didn't know about these children, but they do now. Any child that's affected after this point is on their shoulders because they know about it, and yet they don't. But here we are, what, 14 years later, and it's, um, it's still going on. It all points to an agenda, though, wouldn't it? That even all the time you've been involved in this, you must have sat back and thought to yourself, this is an agenda. Oh, there's, there's definitely a, a, a working of different groups to an agenda here. It's not just coincidence, it's not just mishap. It's no, but they know about it's, it, yeah, they yeah. do. I mean, we've, we've seen copies of the minutes of the meetings where they're talking about the MMR before it was even introduced. And they're available online now. And six months before they introduced it, in those minutes, they're referring to the neurological problems linked with each of the three brands they were considering introducing. But the Dr. Salisbury, who's the principal medical officer, was present at that meeting and is still in post now. And he drove the consensus to bring that vaccine in. And it's ironic that whenever we've had a problem with the vaccine, it's him we're supposed to report it to. <laughs> so he's like marking his own homework. Um, and he needs to be out of his post. He, there's quite a few things that need to be done, yes. But, um, and he's a teacher <coughs> personally as well. When I attended one meeting uh, that the Department of Health organised uh, about 18 months ago, um, he asked me why, like, why I was there <laughs> when it was a vaccine meeting. 
He's ready for retiring oh. uh, now. But he's, uh, he was in his you have a hope. <laughs> <laughs> but he'll get a knighthood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Could I just ask you with regard to Dr. Wakefield? Do, oh, you, yes. do you agree with his assessment that part of the problem is that this country, because of the NHS, is very much a closed shop? And in America, there's still a degree of freedom, but a caveat of that is. You know, you've just had Obamacare introduced into America. Obviously, like Alex just mentioned, there is an agenda. It's all consolidation. Uh, there was a well-known statistic about the NHS a few years ago was it was the third largest employer in the world after the Indian Railway and the Russian Army. And the drug companies. Oh, and the pharmaceutical oh, industry yes, is yes. the biggest industry yes. in America, per se. Obviously, all this interlinks. I mean, I think the NHS... You know, they are going to protect their own pensions, aren't they? I mean, they well, yes, they, um, I find it ironic that the anti-convulsants I've had to give to my son are made by the same drug company that caused the problem. Um, so, really, the drug companies don't catch any harm either way because they're providing the vaccines and then they're providing all the anti, anti-inflammatories and anti-convulsants. Um, in America, they have a lot of pharmaceutical advertising as well. Um, in the UK, pharmaceutical influxes to pay for wings on wards. Um, they pay for um, fact-finding missions in different countries. So um, there's, there's a lot of money changing hands. Um, it, it has been criticised. We're concerned because um, currently, and this happened, would you believe it's on April Fool's Day two years ago, the government handed over the decision-making policy for what vaccines are to be introduced into the UK to the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation. Now that JCVI body is unelected by us. We can't vote them out. Yeah, and if you look on the website, they've got direct and indirect links with the pharmaceutical company. So really, they've got a blank checkbook. Any vaccine they say needs to be introduced, the minister is obliged to introduce it. Before that date, before that April Fool's date, they suggested vaccines to the minister, and they ultimate, the minister ultimately made the decision, and you can vote them out. Mm -hmm. But this body, direct and indirect links to the pharmaceutical, uh, this is the, this what we call the third sector, the third sector, the Tony Blair introduced us. It's an element of community, communitarianism, and uh, they brought it in as a non elected view on everything. The, the government of the country is not just within your realm, it's also across the board. And this is, it takes away our say, our vote, our uh, control over what should be public sector yeah. and government agencies. And yes. it's happening everywhere, yeah. it's getting really bad now. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely, it's called a third way. Decisions should not have just gone through, it should have been debated, yes. people should have had an opportunity to oppose it, yeah. but it was just automatically put to the statute. Board. Jackie, you've been an absolute star. Oh. Oh.